the first verse, second verse, and then the third verse into the chorus. First verse, chorus, second verse, chorus, third verse. No, yeah, and, yeah, and it's the yeah. third part of the end is the verse, not the chorus. Yeah. See, and he, he I, I said, what happened to Bonnie said, I said, what did it show to go to? And he was, yeah, this, he said, this isn't my show. I thought, I thought that was pretty good. There was no, he thought he always did at the end of the verse and before the chorus every time. Yeah, that works. Yeah, yeah. How's everybody doing? Let's sing a little bit. Then we'll turn Tawa loose. Come, now is the time to worship. Hey, Brother Leroy.
Good job, James. Good evening. Thank you all for being here tonight. Before we uh, pray and stuff, I got a little bit of scripture I wanted to read out of Matthew in <coughs> chapter 17. This is right after the the transfiguration, it's, I won't read it all, but it's basically the disciples see this guy and he has a demon in him and stuff and then they try and heal him and they fail and then the man's father comes to Jesus Christ and just falls on his knees in front of God and Jesus ends up healing this man and casting out this demon and the disciples, as soon as they're alone with Jesus Christ, just ask why they weren't able to drive out this demon, why they couldn't do it. And Jesus responds to them in verse 20. He said, because of the littleness of your faith, for truly I say to you, if you have the faith the size of a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible to you. And that's just showing how little faith we need to have in Jesus Christ and how, um, like how much we can do with that. This, I don't know if you guys have seen a mustard seed. If you ever eat that seedy mustard, that, that is not a, very big, not a very big amount of faith that we need. And this is a reminder to me as I was reading it today that no matter what's going on and no matter what we're dealing with, that we can at least have the tiniest bit of faith that Jesus Christ will move our mountains for us. And so also we need to be keeping the stokes in mind with this, reading this this prayer with everything that's going on with Noah and Chloe today. If we have that little bit of faith, and if they have that little bit of faith, God will make everything okay. Let's pray. Dear God, I just thank you for the day, Lord. I thank you for everybody being here, God. I thank you for another Sunday, Lord, a Palm Sunday, God. Lord, I just thank you for you walking into uh, Jerusalem, Lord, on the donkey, Lord, coming in peace, God, as the sacrifice for all of us, Lord. I just thank you for this reminder in Matthew that for us is to have the tiniest bit of faith in you, Lord, and you will, you will move our mountains, God. And I just thank you so much for that, Lord. We pray for the Stokes, God, with all this, these tragedies coming in today. We, Lord, we know it's your plan, God, but help us grieve, not like the world, Lord, but like Christians, God. And I just thank you, Lord, for everything you do for us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. 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 There is a fountain filled with blood.
It's on. Very good. One quick passage of scripture to read for you as we start tonight. We're going to be working through chapter 6 of Why Believe, and uh, which means we're more than halfway through. Right? So, well, if you're reading along, you're more than halfway through. How many of you are still reading along? A few, very good, yay, all right, okay. Um, we're going to start by talking about religious experience as an argument for God, and so I wanted to read of Paul's uh, religious experience in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, and Paul talks about uh, a vision he had of the risen Christ and an experience he had with God. So we'll start at the start of the chapter, we'll read through to verse 6. So 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 1 through 6. If you don't have a handout, please put your hands up and uh, RJ will get one to you, all right? I must go on boasting, Paul writes, although there is nothing to be gained, 
I will go on to visions and revelations from the Lord. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven. Whether it was in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And I know that this man, whether in the body or apart from the body, I do not know, but God knows. This man was caught up to paradise. He heard inexpressible things, things that man is not permitted to tell. I will boast about a man like that, but I will not boast about myself except about my weakness. And even if I should choose to boast, I would not be a fool because I would be speaking the truth. But I refrain so no one will think more of me than is warranted by what I do or say. Uh, now Paul is uh, being a little bit circumspect here. He talks about this man that he knows. Spoiler alert, the man that he knows is himself. Right? And he's talking about his experience. And he has what we would call in, in, in religious studies an ecstatic experience, a vision of the risen Lord um, that's like a personal worship experience that he has. We don't know exactly when it happened or what the context was, but we do know that it was something for Paul. This is after he's been converted, after he meets the risen Lord on the road to Damascus. It's not that experience that he's talking about. It's something later um, that is just an experience he has with the Lord. Okay. Um, I want to talk about human nature today. So this is the last of our lessons on arguments for the existence of God. Right. So these are arguments that really are not necessary or helpful for those that already believe there is a God, right? So for those within the church, and even, fr frankly, for like Muslim neighbors, they don't need to be convinced that God exists, right? But there are a lot of people in our society, roughly 20, 25%, that do not believe in any kind of God or divine being. And there are a whole lot more people, I think, that say they do believe in God, but I'm not sure they really do. I'm not sure that they understand what they mean when they say they believe in God. And so I think it is helpful to be able to set forth these arguments. And the arguments we're going to look at tonight, or the clues or signposts, if you prefer, are from human nature and human experience. So things that are true of us when we look inside of ourselves and we look at the range of human experience. Okay? And so there's four of them, and I managed to get them all onto one side of a handout tonight. I was quite proud of myself for getting that condensed down. Uh, does mean there's a little bit less detail than sometimes. Uh, but religious experience, religious desire, and then free will and reason. So things about human nature that point towards God. Uh, and I actually want to start with free will and reason and spend some time there. And we can go backwards and you guys can ask about whatever you want. Uh, and again, you don't have to wait till I shut up because sometimes I don't shut up. Uh, but I do want to talk about free will and reason and how these point towards God. Now, first, what do we mean by free will? So if I say that uh, Jim has free will, what do I mean by that? What does that mean? Not a rhetorical question. I want an answer. What does it mean to say that Jim has free will? He gets to choose, he gets to choose OK? Um, so he gets to choose between A and B, or multiple options, right? And he can legitimately make a choice with that. His choice is not determined by forces beyond his control. Okay, that's what we mean by free will. In philosophy, we talk about the power of contrary choice. So he makes this choice, but he could have made a contrary choice. Okay, so when Jim goes to a buffet, he could have the fried chicken, or he could make a contrary choice and have the steak. Or he could make a third choice and have both, right? Okay, but we understand that he has the power of contrary choice. That's what we mean by free will, okay? Now it seems to us for two reasons that we do have such um, free will. First of all, when we introspect, when we look inside of ourselves, we do see ourselves making these kinds of decisions, okay? Jim can say, yeah, I, I, you know, I was at a wedding shower on Friday night and I decided to have 10 of everything that was on the table. Linda's not here to tell me not to, so I'm gonna eat it all, right? And that was pretty much what happened on Friday night, right? <laughs> so he introspects, he looks inside of himself, and he sees himself making these kinds of choices. Is that fair, is that accurate? Okay, so introspection tells us that we do have this kind of power of contrary choice. I can choose A, I can choose B, I can, I can make different decisions. 
Now, there are things that influence our decisions. We understand that, right? So, for example, when I go to the buffet table, I'm never going to choose the Brussels sprouts. Amen. All right. That preaches, right? That'll preach. I'm never going to choose the Brussels sprouts. And sorry, I'm never going to choose the okra. <laughs> sorry. It's because I'm Canadian. Do you know they have okra in Myanmar? I go halfway across the world to get away from okra, and they serve me okra in Myanmar. But they call it ladyfingers there, so I just stay away from the ladyfingers in Myanmar. I stay away from the okra here. Um, I'm never going to choose it. Why not? Because yeah, I don't like it. Okay? I didn't grow up on it. I did grow up on Brussels sprouts. Okay. Oh, yeah. Oh, man, bad taste on my mouth still today. Right? But I'm never going to choose them because I don't like them. On the other hand, when I go to the dessert table, if there's chocolate cheesecake, I'm probably going to choose that 10 times out of 10 right? because it's like my favorite thing. Okay? So we do understand there are things that influence our choices. And we also understand there are some things in which we do not make a choice. I haven't heard anybody sneeze yet tonight. But by and large, when you sneeze, you haven't decided to sneeze. I think I'll interrupt by sneezing right now. That's not a choice we make. That's just a natural occurrence that happens, right? We have bodily functions. They just happen. There are other things that we understand happen because they are determined, <clears throat> right? They're following just the law of gravity, the laws of nature, the way they're laid out. So not everything is freely chosen that we do. But there are decisions that we make that are free choices. Okay, so that's the first thing that points towards free will. The other is what we call moral accountability. And we have, again, a deep-seated understanding that if we do something wrong, we deserve to be blamed. And if we do something good, we deserve to be praised. And if somebody else does something good, they deserve to be praised. And if they do something wrong, they deserve to be blamed. Okay. And again, this is something which is universal across human nature, human societies. People of all worldviews have this deep-seated understanding that we are morally accountable for the things that we do, and other people are morally accountable as well. Moral accountability, it seems, requires that we have freedom, that we have the power of contrary choice. Now, I don't know if you all knew this, but my cousin James was once arrested for robbing the corner store. Okay. And he was arrested for robbing the corner store. And his mom said, James, you're a bad boy. You shouldn't have done that. It, spoiler alert, he wasn't really, OK? Just in case anybody wondered, OK? You shouldn't have done that. But if he had done it, his mother would have said, James, you shouldn't have done that. And she would punish him for it. She would hold him accountable. Now, here's a question. Let's say, just for the sake of argument, okay, so take off your free will shoes and put on shoes that say we don't have free will. If James does not have free will, could he have chosen to not rob the corner store? No, right? It would have been, as it were, something that was forced upon him, laws of nature, upbringing, whatever, okay? He's not in control of his actions, so there's no moral accountability. Does it make sense to blame James if he couldn't have done otherwise? No, right? Where there is no ability to have done otherwise, there is no moral accountability. There is no blame and there is no praise. Okay? So again, this understanding that we are morally accountable and that others are morally accountable points towards the existence of free will. Now the question is, what could possibly explain this free will that we have? And here is where naturalistic worldviews, atheistic worldviews, run into problems. There are all sorts of animals that do things that we consider pretty nasty. Um, I don't know if you ever watch Discovery Channel or like Disney World and stuff like that, but they usually censor out like the real stuff that goes on in nature and they don't let you see it. We were talking, I don't remember where we were talking about this, but uh, you know, like, um, a lot of insects, including a lot of spiders, after the male and female are done mating, guess what happens to the male? The female eats them. Well, that's not very nice. Well, do we throw these female spiders in prison for murder? No, why not? 
They're programmed to do this. This is what they do by nature. They are following, as it were, their natural programming, their instincts, okay? And that's just what they do. And I, we could go on and on and just scare everybody to death tonight with the horrible things that go on in the natural world, okay? But we won't. We'll just set that aside and recognize that when animals do these things, they're just following their biological programming. Now, if it is the case that humans are just a part of the natural world, if we are not created by God, if we are not created in the image of God, if we are just like the other animals in the animal kingdom, here's the question, do we have free will? And the answer is no, because we're just like them. If evolution is the story of how we got here, just blind natural forces, is how we got here, there is no room in that worldview for free will, okay? So in argument form, we say this, premise one, we have libertarian freedom such that A, we do make legitimate decisions and B, we are morally accountable. Secondly, either God created the world or the world is a cosmic accident. Third, libertarian freedom is inexplicable if the world is a cosmic accident. In other words, if the world is just here, if atheism is true and God did not create it, then there is no explanation for us having free will. Either we don't have it at all, or it's just an utter mystery of how it could be here. Fourth, libertarian freedom is really easy to explain if God exists and created the world. If God is a moral agent, if God is a being who does things and creates us in his image, then God can endow us with free will as well. And so free will makes sense within a Christian worldview. Therefore, free will makes it more likely that God exists and created the world. Now, that's not a slam dunk argument by any stretch of the imagination, but I think it's interesting how our deep-seated intuition that we do have freedom is yet another signpost, another clue that points towards the existence of God. Okay, does that make sense? Right? I think that's actually a really helpful article because virtually every skeptic that you meet will be really emphatic about the fact that they don't want to be answerable to somebody else. They don't want somebody else to be in control. That's part of the reason why some people don't like the notion of God because then they're answerable to somebody. But they do like the idea of being in charge of their own life. Well, here's the thing. If there is no God, you're not in charge of your own life. Your biology is in charge of your life. Okay? You don't have the freedom that you think you have. Okay. All right. Any thoughts or questions on that? I think that's just kind of a fun little argument, a clue that points towards God. All right, then let's turn to reason. If there's anything else that atheists really like, it's rationality. Okay? They like to be rational, they like to be reasonable, this is a good thing. This is something that we should have in common with them. Right? As believers in God, we should also care about rationality and about being reasonable people. Again, if God created us in his image and God is a rational, ordered, reasoned being, then we would bear that as his image bearers. And so we should care about reason, about logic, about evidence. Okay? Um, oh goodness, 2015, I think it was, might be a little longer ago, uh, there was this big rally in Washington, D.C. called the Rally for Reason, and it was organized by several different atheist organizations. Um, and so their, their rally kind of against religion and against religious superstition, and they called it the R Rally for Reason. Right? They want reason to replace religion in society. And they're their notion is that if only we could get people to think clearly and to think critically and to use the rational faculties that they have, well, then we could eliminate religion in society. Okay? Um, I actually think it's the other way around, but that's okay. okay. So the argument from reason goes a little bit like this. Now, first of all, we, again, we all use reason whether we think we do or not. Okay? We all process things. Have you ever gone to the grocery store and you're like, okay, should I get this block of cheese or this block of cheese? And then you ask yourself the question, well, which one is cheaper? And how do you figure out which one is cheaper? Please don't say your calculator. <laughs> Sorry? 
price per ounce. There you go, right? So you have to use your reason. And notice, even if you use your cal or your phone, sorry, there is no such thing as calculators anymore. If you use your phone or if you're just looking at the price per ounce, you're using your reason to process, all right, which one is cheaper, and then you buy it accordingly. We use our reason all the time, every day. Uh, every time you drive down the road, you see these little signs on the side of the road and they're kind of rectangular and they're white background and then they have like black numbers that are written on it and it says maximum, right? And so your reason processes that and it says, oh, I have to drive at least that fast. <laughs> That's, uh, it's more of a suggestion than a guy, yeah, yeah. It's like the pirate rules. No reaction whatsoever, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but we process those, we take those signs in, we process them through and we say, okay, I better keep my speed under that, especially if there's a police car around, okay? But we process it, we reason through it. We're using our reason all the time, okay? Every day, millions of times a day, we are using our rational faculties. Now, this actually ends up being kind of an odd thing, right? It, it's hard to think about our reason. Have you ever asked yourself the question, what is my reason for? What is it directed towards? Okay. In philosophy, again, we like to call it our rational faculties or our cognitive faculties. That's just a big way of saying our thinkings. Right? What are your thinkings for? What are they oriented towards? Yeah, we really don't think about that a lot, do we? Now, here's the thing, though. Under the surface, I think you think that your thinkings are oriented towards truth, to understanding things the way they are. Do I need to say that again? Was it too many things? Okay. I think that you think that your thinkings are aimed towards truth, to understanding the way things really are. Okay? So every time that you think about things, you're trying to figure out what's really real, what's true. And that's the way, again, that we tend to go through life. Now, here's the thing, this, this uh, you know, however long ago it was that you've taken biology, right, but classic Darwinian biology, what are living systems aimed towards? What's the goal of your biological systems? Survival, okay? Survival or thriving, we could put, right? So survival, propagation of the individual, of the species, right? Now, if again, if humans are the product of evolution, purely evolutionary forces, nothing else involved, just random natural evolutionary processes, then what are your thinkings aimed at? Survival, okay? Survival, um, propagating your species, okay? Managing to carry on. That's what your thinkings would be aimed towards. Because again, if it's the product of just these blind evolutionary forces and evolution is pointed towards survival, your rational capacities are part of your evolutionary package. And they are then aimed also towards survival. Now here's the question. Does survival require you to know what is true? Because if it does, okay, so here's the thing, right? So, so a, a skeptic could say, well, yes, this is fair. Our thinkings are aimed towards survival. But in order to survive, it's better to know what is true, what is really real. And therefore, our thinkings have evolved to be aimed towards truth because truth aims towards survival. Okay. I actually think that's a really optimistic perspective that cannot be sustained particularly when we think about the things that we watch on the news and TV shows that we watch, we, we tend to actually enjoy fiction a lot more than fact sometimes. Um, but it actually gets worse, okay? It turns out that, yeah, we don't actually need to know how things are in order to survive really effectively, okay? And so philosophers come up with all sorts of fun thought experiments. So there's like Frank and the lion, and like, so Frank is like a caveman, right? And, and he sees a lion coming towards him, and now in order to survive, what does Frank need to do? Run, yeah, run, and, or climb a tree or something, right? So now, if Frank is thinking, lion, lion will eat me, therefore run, that's going to work, right? That's gonna help him survive. But if Frank thinks, lion, 
ooh, lion wants to play tag, I have to run and get away, that's going to be equally effective at helping Frank survive. Frank doesn't need to know what is true in order to survive. He just has to act the right way. And he can act the right way for reasons that have nothing to do with the truth and still survive. In other words, his thinkings do not need to be oriented towards truth in order for Frank to survive. Okay. It gets worse, though. Virtually every atheist that I've read will argue that religion is false. Okay? So Christianity in particular, just not true. Okay? However, those same atheists will acknowledge that throughout human history, religion has been tremendously effective at helping us survive and thrive as a species. In fact, some of them argue that it is the human invention of religion that allowed us to dominate the planet. Because religion brought things like moral accountability, the understanding that we had to do the right thing or else we were going to pay a price for it. It contributed to social cohesion, kind of an us versus them that helped groups to survive against all sorts of threats that they might face. Okay? So now notice what happens though. The atheist says religion is false, but religion has helped contribute to human survival and flourishing. So what are they saying? They're saying that our thinkings can arrive at something which is totally false, but nonetheless has incredible survival benefit. Okay? Now you see the problem. They're saying then our thinkings do not have to be oriented towards truth in order to help us survive. So if we think our thinkings are oriented towards truth, we have good reason to question whether or not we are the result of blind evolutionary forces. If, on the other hand, we are created by a divine being who himself is rational and who desires us to know both him and his world, then we have reason to trust that our thinkings are oriented towards truth. Because if our thinkings are oriented towards truth, then we can actually come to know him and to know his world accurately. Okay? So again, is this a slam dunk argument? No. Okay? But the argument goes basically, again, this five-step argument. A, we, we all act as if, and we think that we do, possess trustworthy and truth-oriented rational faculties. Either God created the world or he didn't. Trustworthy reason cannot be explained on other worldviews, like atheism or Hinduism. Hinduism is even worse on this front, really has a miserable time trying to explain how we can trust our reason. But trustworthy reason is easy to explain if God exists and created the world, including us. And this, again, makes it more likely that God exists and created the world. Okay? So reason and free will, two typical pillars in a naturalistic worldview I think do a better job of pointing towards God than away from. Okay. Makes it much more likely. Yeah. Now again, does that prove that God exists? No. Okay. Does it make it rationally compelling that God exists? No. Right? Somebody can still disbelieve God and still be a rational person. Okay. In other words, these arguments don't force the issue. They're not going to compel anybody on pain of being irrational or contradictory, that they have to confess that God exists. Okay. But it is an argument that points in that direction, and that's really all that we're looking for with these. But I think they're really interesting clues. Okay. Um, all right, should I walk through another one of them, or do you guys want to ask some questions? All right, if I don't see hands, I'm going to walk through you. I heard a voice, but I didn't hear what it said. Go on. All right, I'll go on, which is actually going back, so I'll, I'll back up. Uh, do we want to talk about religious experience or religious desire? Who says desire? Who says experience? Oh, oh dear. Okay, that's a pretty close vote. Um, all right, so we'll go with experience. Sorry for those that voted for desire. Um, okay, so religious experience points towards God. Now, here's where this gets complicated, okay? This isn't something that favors Christianity as opposed to other worldviews. People have religious experiences in all sorts of religious traditions. Christianity, um, Islam, uh, Mormonism, Buddhism, Hinduism, Judaism, 
animism. All sorts of people have religious experiences. Okay? So again, this isn't something that is going to settle the truth in favor of Christianity. Um, all right, so two philosophical principles that we need to establish in order for this argument to work. And these are both, as it turns out, really, really important philosophical principles. And that's the reason I'm going to go to this argument instead of the other one, okay? Because chances are you've probably never heard of them, and you don't realize that you're actually using them all throughout your life. But you are, okay? So first is the principle of credulity. Uh, the principle of credulity basically means that you take people's word for things unless you have good reason not to. Now, all of us need to have a drunken uncle, right? So everybody has that drunken uncle that you can never trust, that he's always pulling your leg, always telling you stories, right? You all got your drunken uncle in mind? Okay. Apart from your drunken uncle, you tend to take people's word for things when they tell you something. So if I say, hey, Paul, where were you last Sunday? On the island of Kauai, right? Unless I have some reason not to, I'm going to take Paul's word for it, that he was on Kauai, okay? Now, if I saw Paul at the supermarket last weekend, then that might lead me to question him, right? But by and large, we just take people's word for it. And we also expect people to take our word for it. So if we tell people something and they say, hmm, I don't know if I can believe you, we're kind of offended, right? And as it turns out, again, you operate by this principle of credulity, and if you didn't, you would never learn anything. So think about how you came to know the things that you know. Uh, so as an example, what color are my jeans? Glenda, what color are my jeans? Blue. Blue. Very good. Okay. Now, how did all of us learn that these are blue? We can look around the room and see other blue things, right? They're called blue jeans. They're called blue jeans, and how did we learn that? My mama told me, right? That's how you learn that this is blue. My mama told me. That's how we learned what an apple is. That's how we learned what a ball is. That's what we learned what hot was. That what we, that's how we learned what bad was, okay? All the, virtually, not quite all, but probably 99%, probably more, of the things that you know, you learned from other people. You didn't figure it out yourself. You were told by somebody else, a teacher, a parent, a peer, a book, a TV show, a documentary, whatever. The principle of credulity says, we take mama's word for it unless we have reason not to. We take teacher's word for it unless we have reason not to. We take the news's word for it unless we have reason not to. Okay, so we take people's word for it unless we have some compelling reason not to. The principle of testimony, okay? By and large, sorry, I actually have the principles backward. The principle of testimony is we take people's word for it. Okay, the principle of credulity is if you experience something, you take it to mean that that thing exists. Okay, so if Paul was on the island of Kauai last week, he would take that as sufficient reason to think the island of Kauai exists. If he was bitten by a snake, he would take that as sufficient reason to think that the snake exists. If he had a cup of tea with the queen, he would take that as sufficient reason to think the queen exists. Okay, so principle of credulity, you take things for granted when you experience them. Principle of testimony, you trust other people's word for it when they say it, okay? Sorry, I got them backwards, now I got you all confused. All right. Now, when you put these two principles together with the prevalence of religious experience in the world, you end up with, again, an implicit, soft argument for the existence of God. Why? Well, because as it turns out, there's billions of people who say that they've had religious experiences where they've experienced some sort of divine reality, and many hundreds of millions of those will say, I've met God. God has met me, whether it's in worship, whether it's like Paul's experience. Uh, you can go out through the centuries, Christian mystics and saints and everyday Christians, okay, experiencing the reality of God in their life. So if you're one of those people who has had a religious experience like that, that is a sufficient reason for you to believe there's something on the other side of that experience. God exists. Okay? So you then have reason to believe that God exists. But when you put hundreds of millions of these testimonies together, the principle of testimony says we should take that to mean something. Okay? Uh, now, I'm oftentimes asked, well, what about alien abductions? 
well, what about alien abductions? Well, people say that they've been abducted by aliens, okay? Good, let's consider that. First of all, how many, right? And as it turns out, there's a few thousand people that have somewhat credible stories of being abducted by aliens, right? Now, here's the thing. I, I don't wanna get into aliens any further than that, okay? I just wanna use it as an example. If somebody wants to use a few thousand examples of alien abduction stories as a reason for me to believe that aliens exist, and there's hundreds of millions of religious experiences that people are saying are connecting them with God, shouldn't that then be a really powerful argument that God exists? Okay. Now, I will say, I do think that we should at least take alien abduction stories seriously and not immediately assume that somebody's just crazy. Because look, if there's people that say that this has happened to them, I think the principle of testimony and just Christian charity says take the person seriously. I mean, don't automatically assume that, okay, so there's aliens here trying to mess with us, right? There might be other explanations, but at least take their story seriously and be willing to investigate it if you care enough. Okay? Now, for me, aliens just aren't important enough for me to care a whole lot about that, right? But if they were, then I think I'd want to spend some time looking into those kinds of stories. Same thing with Bigfoot. I had somebody ask me about Bigfoot on Friday. I'm like, I don't care whether Bigfoot exists or not. So I'm not going to spend any time looking at your pictures. I just don't care. Huh? Sorry. Any Bigfoot believers out there? Where's our Bigfoot believers? There's some in every crowd. Come on, guys. Be proud. No? There's none in here? Okay. Well, that's all right. Um, okay, so that's basically the argument from religious experience. Hundreds of millions, probably billions of people have had experiences they understand to be God reaching into their lives and touching their lives. And we should take those testimonies seriously. And at the very least, those people have good reason to believe that God exists. Okay? And again, I think we should take that combined testimony very, very seriously. Okay. All right, let's open it up for questions. We won't hit on religious desire unless somebody asks a question about the argument from religious desire, in which case I won't have a, a choice. Okay. But Tom's got a microphone, so if you've got a question, put your hand up and we'll engage them. Thoughts? Questions? Oh dear, it's a quiet group. All right. I've always operated on the principle of believe people the first time, even if somebody else says they're not trustworthy. Yeah. How do we, as we go along life, how do we know whether to accept testimony or whether to just blow it off? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question, right? I think we tend to get a little bit more skeptical or cynical as we get older because there are just more times that real, we realize, oh, that person was lying to me or tricking me or whatever, right? We is the once bitten, twice shy. And so the younger we are, the less often we've been tricked. And so the more trusting we tend to be. I think it is healthy to remind ourselves that we do owe it to one another to be generally trusting and to take people's words for things. Um, which means even when a politician stands up and says, read my lips, no new taxes, we should presume that they really hope and desire and intend to keep that promise. Okay. Now, once they've been elected and they've promised that and they've broken that promise, we maybe don't reelect them. Um, I don't know. Uh, but I, th I think we, we need to remind ourselves that we should extend to other people that same charity, that same trust that we want people to extend to us. Right? I don't want people to be skeptical of everything that I tell them. Well, and if Jesus says, you know, treat others, do not do unto others as you would have them, do unto others as you would have them do unto you, I think it covers the way that we tend to take their words for things. Yeah, it's hard though, once you've, been, once you've been burned, it's hard to, right? That drunken uncle, don't trust him, okay? Because he keeps burning you, but uh, otherwise, yeah. Uh, I think you just covered it, Carl, right? It, it's, God gave us the example of charity. 
He gave us the example of trust. He gave us the example of seeking all people, not just those that were nice and desirable and fun to be around. Uh, and I think I, there's the there's the worldview of a glass half full or glass half empty. I disagree with both statements. I agree with Jim. I think it's a glass full. I meet someone for the first time, and I'm going to trust them. I'm going to believe that they are who they say they are and what they say they are. That's a glass. Ha that's not a glass half full or a glass half empty. I'm not going to meet you for the first time, eh? Yeah. And say I don't. Well, I'm halfway trusting this. I, I believe in, in. That's the way God wants us to be toward people. Yeah. He wants to be that that generous. Yeah, yeah. And again, will we get burned? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yep. And then, then I know that yep. I'm just going to read from Acts chapter nine. This is after after Paul's conversion on the road to Damascus. Uh, he actually has some of this happen in Damascus, but then he comes to Jerusalem, and verse twenty six. It says, when Paul came to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples, but they were all afraid of him, not believing that he really was a disciple. But Barnabas, I love that, right? But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles. He told them how Saul on his journey had seen the Lord and that the Lord had spoken to him, right? Um, so again, now, I mean, Paul had literally burned some bridges, right? He burned some people. Um, and so there was reason for the apostles in Jerusalem to distrust, um, but Barnabas had already given Paul another chance, right? And so then Barnabas takes the initiative to introduce Paul to the disciples in Jerusalem. And that, I think, is a good example of that grace that God desires for us to extend to other people, even people who once were enemies and professed to have changed. Uh, remember the words of Jesus. I think this is in Matthew 18. Somebody will correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, the passage on forgiveness where Jesus is asked, come on, Jesus, how many times do I have to forgive my brother? Seven times? And what's Jesus' response? Yeah, not seven, but 70 times seven, right? Um, in other words, we keep getting burned and we keep giving second chances. Okay. Yeah. Oh, sorry, I thought you were going to somebody else. Okay. Okay. Yep, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, I have a sum up. It's, it's from C.S. Lewis, and uh, Lewis is great on this, okay? Um, and, you know, I wasn't going to talk about it because I thought we could go at least one night without talking about sex here, and so now you just blew it, so sorry. Um, but C.S. Lewis notes that humanity has, human beings have a whole lot of natural desires, okay? And he says all of the things that, that we have innate natural desires for, they all have something that exists in reality that is capable of satisfying those desires. And so he uses the three very, very common, easy examples, right? We desire food. We're hungry. There is food. We're thirsty. There is water. We have sex drive. There is sex, right? And then there's other things that we all have a longing for as well. Community, the desire to be loved, the desire for meaning, right? There's all of these things that we have deep longings for. You don't have to teach anybody to desire these things. The desires are just there. You don't have to teach, you know this really well right now, you don't have to teach your baby to be hungry. She's just always hungry, right? You don't have to teach it, it's natural. Now, we can still starve to death. Just because there is such a thing as food doesn't mean that we will get any, but it does mean that something exists in reality that is capable of satisfying the desire that we have. And then Lewis notes that we all have these religious desires. We have a desire to know and to touch something transcendent, something beyond us. And we have an innate desire to live past our physical death. And if, again, if these are natural desires that you don't need to be taught and that are virtually universal, Lewis says, well, in all these other cases, these natural desires have something that exists in reality that can satisfy them. And so it seems that we should expect that to be the case here as well. We have these natural desires. There ought to be something in reality that's capable of satisfying those desires. Okay. Pretty simple analogical argument. Okay. Again, it's not a really strong argument in the sense that it's going to compel rational belief, but it's another clue. It's another signpost that just points towards the fact that we have been designed in a particular way 
that all of these aspects of life point towards God, okay? Which is a good way to kind of segue and sum up where we've been the last four weeks. I like thinking of theistic arguments as being like a wheel, okay? They're like spokes in a wheel. And you know, the spokes in a wheel, they're all intended to support the structure of the entire wheel, okay? And they all point towards the hub. And I think at the center of this hub is God. And all of these different arguments are spokes that are pointing all in the same direction, all supporting the same fundamental belief. There is a God. Okay, so arguments from cosmology, from causation, arguments from design and fine-tuning, moral arguments, ontological arguments, arguments from religious experience, arguments from desire, arguments from human nature. All of these different spokes all pointing towards the same thing. All of these facets of human life all supporting the same basic contention. There is a God. Okay? It's eminently reasonable to draw that conclusion that God exists. Now, does that prove Christianity is true? No, right? And so we need chapters 7 and 8, which we will turn to after Easter. Um, so we're going to spend, I think, two weeks looking at the nature of Scripture. So we're going to look at uh, textual integrity, and then we'll look at historical reliability, and then we'll look at the person of Jesus, and then chapter 9, which should have been on Easter Sunday, but, you know, we didn't get our act together fast enough. Uh, we'll look at arguments for the resurrection, okay, how we can know the resurrection really happened. Okay, so that's where we're going to be in the coming weeks. Yeah. All right. Will anybody object if we end three minutes early? No? All right. Let's close in prayer, and we'll be dismissed. Thank you for being here. Lord God, we do thank you. We thank you for your goodness, for your grace. Lord, we thank you for having created us, and Lord, creating us in your image and providing all of these clues and pointers, Lord, that point straight back to you. Lord, we thank you as well for the love that you have shown in the gift of your son. We're reminded, Lord, that we're entering into Easter week, the week when you enter into Jerusalem, knowing that your death is right around the corner. And Lord, we thank you for the sacrifice that you made on our behalf. Lord, help us to meditate on what it means for us, for our loved ones, for our family, for our friends. And Lord, we do pray that we would have the boldness to invite those who do not yet know you to come and to experience you next Sunday. And we pray that you would work in their hearts and draw them to you. Lord, we thank you, we praise you, and we worship you. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. And you are dismissed. <laughs>